So ALK positive lung cancer was discovered in 2007 and it really came to everyone's notice because it responded beautifully to this drug called crizotinib. Crizotinib now has a license in both treatment naive and in um, post chemotherapy treated patients in many countries around the world. But it's not a cure. So crizotinib will still, after initially great responses, the patient's cancer will still progress. And to put this in context, what proportion of patients with non-small cell lung cancer are susceptible to out-directed agents? So it's somewhere between two and seven percent, depending on the degree of enrichment. So we know it's slightly more common in adenocarcinomas and never smokers. It doesn't appear to be a race or gender specific bias. But the figures which have the higher percentage, you know, have enriched for never smoking adenocarcinomas. The general feeling is it's running about two to four percent. So an important minority but when it comes to the treatment we've been here before in other cancers you can get resistance developing to this wonderful agent yeah so probably on an average between about eight and ten months after you start on this drug some degree of resistance will occur either in the body or you can progress in the brain and they're probably different mechanisms mm. enter then uh, next generation um, ALK directed therapy. So next generation ALK inhibitors have, have come on. There's one licensed one, seretinib, made by Novartis, and they're really, uh, they actually attack both things. So one is they attack a number of the known biological mechanisms of resistance. So you can get new point mutations occurring in ALK. You can have increases in the number of copies of your rearranged ALK gene to get around the crizotinib, and these drugs work best in those. Also, because crizotinib is relatively poor at penetrating into the brain, these drugs get better into the brain and now you deal with that as a mechanism of acquired resistance too. Right. So can you tell me about brigatinib and what you've been, why you were using it and what you've been doing with it? Well, so I've used all of the next generation ALK inhibitors. Brigatinib is one made by a relatively small company called Ariad. Uh, they are trying to develop a drug that was active against a very broad range of these resistance mechanisms and it also has very good penetration into the central nervous system. And so we're seeing that maybe not all next generation inhibitors are actually the same. So for example, the median progression-free survival for many of the ALK inhibitors post crizotinib is running about six or seven months. With brigatinib in our study, it's now running over a year, 13.8 months. And when you start to look at the brain as a separate part of your body and you capture that data robustly, you can see responses in the brain running about 50%. And can you tell me what you did in this study to establish that? So this is a second line study, post crizotinib, where people go on brigatinib with the dose having figured out in the phase one proportion of the study. So it's an expanded phase one two looking primarily in the post crizotinib, although some TKNA patients are in there too. And how many patients did you look at and what sort of levels of response did you get? You got beyond a year, you were saying, but in how many patients? So it's uh, about 100 patients. We're getting a response rate of about 70% and the duration of response is very good. And as I said, the median progression-free survival is over a year. Mm. Could you tell me what then are the clinical implications, first of all, of this specific therapy, brigatinib, and then perhaps of the other next generation inhibitors? So uh, brigatinib has received FDA breakthrough status, which just means they have a, a hotline through to the FDA, so the, the FDA is watching this closely. There is a registration single, well technically it's a two-arm study because they're exploring two doses, but there's only the one drug in there going on at present, and if that shows these same kind of promising results, the hope is this will become a licensed drug, at least by the FDA, within a year or so. Um, the other drugs, Electinib, made by Genentech Roche, also a very good drug, similarly has got breakthrough status, and they will be filing, there. we've already seen their data, they're running about a sort of 50-60% response rate, medium progression free survival, seven or eight months, and then seritinib is already licensed. What sort of toxicity were you getting with brigatinib? So uh, it's very well tolerated in most people. Early on there was a slightly mysterious signal of people getting what they called early onset pulmonary symptoms. So w literally within hours, sometimes days of going on it, a very small proportion of people were getting what was essentially inflammation in the lungs. What we realized from actually studying one particular patient, because there'd been the anecdotes of people who said, well, I got short of breath, I didn't want to bother you, doctor, and then it got better. We actually had a patient who we 
we knew very well who went on the brigatinib, got this, and we actually kept him on the drug and monitored him, monitored his oxygen saturations, gave him steroids, and he clearly pushed through this all by himself while still being exposed to the drug. So if you get it and you can tolerate it, after about four or five days you get better. And that led to the idea that maybe we could reduce the incidence by starting at a low dose, getting through this if you're going to have it subclinically, and then going up on the dose. So remember I said the phase two study is two doses. One is starting at 90 and then escalating to 180. The other is staying at 90. So that, that sort of subclinical dosing uh, for one week is, is very interesting and it seems to have really dropped down the rate of these pulmonary symptoms. And based on the information we now have about these next generation agents, what should clinicians be thinking about doing soon? Well, at the moment, you, you only have access to the licensed treatments, but you need to know these other ones are coming. And when they come, obviously people will sort of present various bits of data, but you need to start to look at what are the differentiating things. So how good is their data in the central nervous system? Not, we got an MRI and things got smaller, but what is the proportion of people shrinking? What is the duration of benefit in the brain? And then what is the duration of benefit in the body? Are we suppressing as many resistance mechanisms as we can? So based on the evidence you're presenting here uh, at the ASCO meeting, what's the, the brief um, summary of it all? So I think, I think the realization as these data mature that maybe not all of these next generation inhibitors are the same. They're going to have strengths and weaknesses. Brigatinib is looking very good, um, but you know, it's, it's up against some big players too.